Oh my god, y'all, it's her day! And this painting was a gift by my friend, Joyce. Yes! Frida de Hey! Vamos! Woo! Salve Divanot, welcome to Cronista de Indias, the Her Story YouTube channel by Dr. Andrea Lorena Fernandez. Please subscribe below and follow on Instagram. Check out the podcast, Why Do We Read This? on classics and pop culture, which I co-host with Dr. Rebecca Salo from Baruch College. Link in the description. Thanks for supporting my research. In the last episode 24 about Soldaderas Part 2, we discussed Nelly Campovello's child narrator in Cartucho, reclaiming the Mexican Revolution. In that episode, we did a recap of the soldadera in pop culture, discussed Nelly Campobello as an author, then did a selection of two stories from Cartucho and some book recommendations. This episode, though, it's very special. This is about Frida's personal letters to Abby Rockefeller and Dolores del Rio et al. It's about self-promotion and vulnerability from 1932 to 48. self-portrait at the Mexican-USA border from 1932. We're going to proceed to read this painting in light of Chicas Modernas theory and the transnational womanhood of the interbellum of the 1920s and 30s. See the previous three episodes for more on this. Frida's epistolary or personal letters, that's part two. We have seven letters for this episode spanning the Great Depression and World War II. And the last thing we're going to discuss is why is she a feminist icon? I really need to know more about this. This painting from 1932 is divided into three sections, also called a triptych. Reading from left to right, we are met with a desertic landscape, ancient pyramids, plants complete with roots, the sun, the moon, all the way up here, and indigenous cultures all the way in the ground. Next, we see Frida standing like a Roman emperor on a stone pedestal with a pink gown, looks like a quinceañera. The inscription reads, Carmen Rivera pintó su retrato en el año 1932. This reminds us again of ancient Roman tradition where artwork tells the viewer who made it. The Pantheon, for example, says Marcos Agrippa Lucius Fili Consul Terti Me Fecit. Marcos Agrippa, son of Lucius, the third consul made me. That's like three times consul because I think he had like three turns as counsel. Anyways, this self-portrait, like the Pantheon, tells you who Frida, who made it, and when, 1932, and what the occupation is, Carmen Rivera, the wife of Diego Rivera. Hmm, pop culture today upholds Frida as an icon of feminine independence, but her own words about herself are those of a woman in 1932. We can't expect her, expect her to think of herself without her husband. Such a thing would be anachronistic, be warned. The last third portion of the triptych on the painting, all the way to the right, is an industrial trip through Detroit's Highland Park Ford plant and skyscrapers where machines march like an army of golems, puffing like gray smoke up in the sky, at least that's what it looks like to me. And the USA flies on the sky with only 48 stars because Hawaii and Alaska gained statehood in 1959. No, the cigarette in her left hand is important for our purposes because it's a sign of the emergence of the Chica Moderna culture. Free Chica Modernas, like Frida, are beacons of transnational womanhood of the interbellum in 1920s and 30s. They are the first generation to attend primary and secondary education with a secular curriculum designed by the populist indigenista governments of the 1920s. They were also the first generation of mujeres de bien, middle class, not sex workers, to work outside of the home. The female urban proletariat plus the experimental womanhood of the 1920s gave us makeup, dancing, dating, no corsets, bathing suits, sports, cosmopolitan girlfriends, radionovelas, short hair, flappers, jazz, Wall Street, cigarettes, Hollywood telegrams, railroad correspondence, and international travel. They're also the first generation to travel, as I mentioned, but also interact with women beyond their culture, even if they are never left their cities, because they had railroads, telegrams, telephones, radionovelas, and transatlantic liners. Some examples of transnational women of the interbellum include Mexico's Frida Kahlo, Nelly Campobello, Maria Felix, and Dolores del Rio, who also was in Hollywood, Chile's Gabriela Mistral, and the Dominican Republic's Mirabal sisters, 
Last, Argentina's Eva Perón, she's a first lady, so travel was not unusual for her post. What is unusual is that she did the European tour and met the Pope alone. A 1933 article from the Detroit News by Florence Davis titled Wife of Master Painter Gleefully Dabbles in Works of Art has generated much attention in the media. Does it seem so out of place now when the painting featured the very article signed as Carmen Rivera? The commentaries on the internet are an attempt to condense Frida into a feminist icon apart from her time period. While she seems closer to us ideologically like right now because of her Marxism and sexual exploration than other women of the 1930s, she's a chica moderna, still holding on to some of those 19th century visions of wifehood as a sort of commonwealth to the husband. This painting, self-portrait, uh, The Border, to me encapsulates the gender proletariat revolution of the interbellum where women participate. Frida's bravado does not occur in a vacuum, and there are other women like her who need our scholarship. Go discover them, go! Moving on to part two of this lesson plan, her letters. For details on Frida's biography and post-mortem contributions to art and feminism and the economy, go elsewhere. There is plenty of info out there. In this episode right here, we'll focus on Frida's epistolary or personal letters. You'll find that painting Frida and letter Frida are two very different people. <laughs> Our letters are seven, divided into two periods. We're doing the Great Depression, 1932 to 39, Frida and Diego wed in 1929. What followed was a period of international travel, interaction with the wives of Robert Barons, patrons, and friendship with Mexican Hollywood diva Dolores del Rio. The World War II letters are different. They're from 1944 to 48, when Frida filed for divorce in 39 and remarried in 1940. This period corresponds with increased sc scrutiny of socialist movements staying tight in Mexico through the war, Russian exiles, and declining health. I've been Frida. able, through my studies, to ID three types of epistolary Fridas that, that is, her letter-writing personalities. All are self-deprecating and vulnerable. One, the middle woman. Two, the provider. And three, the indigenista revolutionary. I said that with an accent. Revolution Revolucionaria, coño. Frida Uno, the middle woman. Consistent with 19th century gender roles where women wrote on behalf of male veterans of the civil wars to gain favors. Letter 1, 1932, to Abby Rockefeller in New York. She says, quote, I want to thank you for the beautiful book you sent me last week. I hope that in spite of my terrible English, I can read it. This hotel room is so ugly that by the flowers, I think I'm in Mexico, unquote. Her English is fine. My father does this all the time. His English is fine too. You see, it's like a defense mechanism of sorts. Sometimes it's unconscious. May, it may be used when you need to appear docile and unthreatening to curry favor with someone of higher status. Abby is a friend and a patron, so Frida's excessive humility bespeaks of economic asymmetry. Anthropologically, this phenomenon applies to immigrants. When I'm around Americans with more money than I, I too am conscious of being the oddball and tempted to use bigger bigger SAT words with an even bigger show of humility to prove that I belong. So why is Frida trying so hard to be like? Is it the money? Better than that. Abby Alric Rockefeller promoted the foundation of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA, in New York City, together with Lily P. Bliss and Mary Quinn Sullivan. The museum was inaugurated on November 8, 1929. In 1932, Diego participated in a MoMA exhibition with four friends. This letter, Frida is hustling. She's managing her husband's career, but maybe consciously or by accident, she ensured that she got to be part of the canon of modern art by befriending New York City's wealthiest patrons and artists and their women, the women who decided what was going to be in MoMA. In April 1932, this new letter, she writes to Clifford and Jan Wright in New York City. She says to these, her American friends, that, quote, Diego wishes that you look for one apartment for us right away because we shall leave New York City next week for Detroit. The one that you describe in your letter, Diego thinks is too small because there's no room to work or paint in it. I'm going to paint there too because I am tired of doing nothing by sitting on the couch. couch. I don't know how to spell this word, unquote. It's funny, she spells couch 
C A U T C H. Um, she's the one arranging lodging and travel for her husband, but she can't leave the couch. She's doing all of the emotional labor. Back to highlighting her English as imperfect. Again, it seems like an endearment ploy or genuine imposter syndrome. Note that she's gonna paint too. The desire to be productive evidences ailing health and the 1932 miscarriage. This all brings us to January 1933, another letter to Abby Rockefeller while Frida is in Detroit. She says, quote, I have no words to thank you for the marvelous photograph of the babies that you sent to me. I wish I could write in English well enough to tell you how much I appreciate your kindness, unquote. Abby Rockefeller is a new mother as of January 1933, whereas Frida miscarries the previous year. Her craving for children is palpable, but she focuses on the English instead. Again, she says, I am painting a little bit too, not because I considered myself an artist or something like that, but simply because I have nothing else to do here and because working, I can forget a little, unquote. That's so sad. <laughs> Number two, the provider, Frida type two. This is consistent with the 19th century, but also with the transition into the 20th, with women entering the public sphere and the workforce as teachers, nurses, and phone operators, these being the more common professions. In October 1934, in a letter to Ella and Beltram D. Wolf from Mexico City, Frida writes, quote, It's been a long time since I wrote, and I don't even know where to begin this letter. You know, everything that has happened, even if I don't give you the details, I have suffered so much. In the first place, it's a double sorrow, you know? You know better than I, better than anyone, what Diego means to me, in all senses. And then, on the other hand, she was the sister I most loved. Unquote. The sleeping with the sister incident is very famous. You can see the Sama Hayek movie uh, for a great example. Frida continues with, I dislike and hate myself. I've wasted the best time living at the expense of a man without doing anything but what I believe would help him and be useful to him. Unquote. Note that she was his public relations manager, real estate agent, and administrator. Let's continue with the letter. I'll try to make a new life, becoming interested in something that allows me to free myself. Wow. In February 1939, she sends a telegram to Dolores del Rio. After the 1939 divorce, Frida ran out of money very quickly and had to make ends meet creatively. The first move was to reach out to fellow Chica Moderna and best friend forever actress, actress Dolores del Rio at Hollywood. The accent again. Never mind. Me encanta mi acento. In a June 1939 telegram from Mexico City, Frida writes, quote, Dolores, darling, beg you to forget this nuisance. You lend me $250, need to resolve emergency, pay you in two months, unquote. In March 1940, this is 10 months later from Coyacan, she writes a letter where she says, quote, I feel terrible that I haven't been able to send you 250 bucks that you kindly lent me. You know, I requested a Guggenheim Fellowship and I hope it comes through by June. I wanted to ask you to please wait until then, unquote. So it's been 10 months. Frida asks for two month, more months. She's dependent on a fellowship and clearly not making enough money as a single woman, but she's trying desperately. It continues, quote, I'm glad you like the painting of the naked girls. I also felt terribly bad about that painting because I promised you it to you a long time ago, unquote. These two paintings, titled Two Nudes in the Forest, or My Wet Nurse, and I, from 1939, are often cited in literature about Frida's sexual orientation. Don't know what to make of this since it was payment for a debt between friends and Dolores del Rio requested the subject matter, not Frida, so think what you will. In another letter to Dr. Samuel Flashlick from 1947, Frida exchanges dental services for a painting. Hers is an informal economy of services and favors for paintings, so the Dolores del Rio painting is not unusual. The next piece is 1940, from 1945. It's not exactly a letter, it's a declaration solicited by the Instituto Nacional de Bellas Artes in Mexico City for a panoramic exhibition of art in the Instituto Nacional. Frida contributed one painting titled Diego in my mind, and she's like all surrounded by white with him like right here, and it's from 1943. This was her artist statement. She says, I began to paint out of pure boredom, being bedridden for a year after suffering an accident. 
I really don't know if my paintings are surrealist or not. From my travels, seeing and observing all I could, I have drawn two positive things. To try to be myself as far as possible and the bitter realization that many lives would still be insufficient to paint as I would like. <laughs> Damn. Wow, wisdom. This is consistent with the 1932 April letter to Jan and Clifford Wright in New York City. The painting must offer a sense of fulfillment, beating boredom aside. The mindfulness community really backs up the whole try to be myself as much as possible thing. And what we see is a very vulnerable person who paints to be herself. Who that is, well, that's up to the viewer because we don't really make, we haven't so met. Let's move over to Frida numero tres, the indigenista revolutionary. And I said that with the right accent. It's always the right accent. She, a declared communist, but also a participant in, the, in Mexico's self-fashioning into a modern state of the cosmic race, a product of mestizaje. From October 1948, a letter to President Miguel Aleman Valdez. This is where I'm citing. She writes, protest the erasure of Diego Rivera's public mural in the Hotel del Prado it, by its North American landlords and Catholic conservatives. This happened several times to, Fido, to Diego's murals, usually when his Marxist imagery pissed off wealthy patrons. See, you can see Man, Man at the Crossroads from 1934. It's a good one. And it's the incident that happened at Rockefeller Center. In the letter, oh, she, she, she does the finger wagon. I have to do it with intensity. Are you, as a Mexican citizen and above all as president of your people, going to permit history, the word, the cultural action, the genius of Mexican artists be silenced? By defending culture, you show the nations of the world that Mexico is free and it's a free country that Mexico is not the uncivilized and savage nation of Pancho Villa, that since Mexico is democratic, the saints and the virgins of Guadalupe are painted as well as the paintings with revolutionary content on the monumental staircases of the Palacio Nacional." Unquote. Frida is equating the president's legitimacy with his duty to protect freedom of expression. Also, for her, Mexicanness equals not Pancho Villa, not war. It equals civility and public art. It's sacred and secular can co coexist for Frida. And Frida is an atheist. She incorporates religious imagery into her paintings for their cultural value. She doesn't shun either. The letter is emasculatory. Quote, now I write to remind you that before anything else, we are Mexicans and we shall not permit anyone and still less few Yankee style hotel owners to strangle the culture of Mexico, the essential root of the life of the nation, denigrating and belittling the national values of world importance and making of a mural painting with universal significance addressed flee, unquote. Again, the Mexican-U.S. borders, a site of identity negotiations, is not over. It's 1948, the eve of the Cold War. The USA and the Western Bloc are about to become very hostile towards Marxism, and they still are. It started with iconoclasm, and it evolves into the dirty wars of the 1970s and 80s, so watch out, ojo. No, life is organic and has roots to Frida, like a tree. The nation is a garden. Her mer metaphors are verdant, whereas male narratives of the same call, uh, call the nation a woman, she, a body, the national body. Frida desexualizes, like Nelly Campobello, see previous episode, uh, as she does for the child narrator of the Mexican Revolution in episode 24. Frida does the same, but by equating the national body to artwork. Let's go to the last part of the lesson. Frida as a feminist icon, according to Nancy Defferbach in her essay, Frida Kahlo, Heroism in Life, she, we ask, why does Frida iconography resonate with so many people, women and men? Frida, Frida, oh, I just, uh, okay. Dr. Defferbach says, one, it's personal specificity. Although Kahlo repeatedly addressed women's issues, through self-portraiture, she never allowed her image to become that of a generic woman. The extreme individuality of her face works against her becoming a symbolic figure that could be reduced to the dichotomies of virgin or whore, or the good mother, or the bad mother. Categories that function to displace women as historical subjects and replace them with symbolic figures. Hey, check out my girl here, Nefertiti. 
She's special because she's different. She stands not for a ideal, but for potential of every woman. Both Frida and Nefertiti are iconographic and they sell well. We like their beauty, their image, their unusualness. Mwah, besitos. For this, you should really check out my episode number four, four on Marianismo for Latin American gender theory. Back to the painting of self-portrait at the Mexican border, not the cigarette again. It personalizes Frida more than the inscription at her feet, I argue. Two, Defferbeck says that sacred and profane imagery combined in Frida, and quote, in her self-portraits, Kahlo presents herself as a goddess or as a saint. Her images of herself are frontal and possibly hyatic and uh, identifiable through symbols. I really, people just keep giving me Frida things. I, I, and I don't use them because of, I, I love them. I, I love Frida. And, and there's no secret that mm, being represented in a sellable portrait format, it makes you immortal. That's why pharaohs like to, you know, pay artists to do that. Let's go to item number three. Frida is an indigenista and she's also an urban proletariat, or at least she says that. Kahlo was one of the, uh, one of modern day Mexican artists who incorporated pre-Columbian elements into her artwork, but her minor manner of incorporating ancient Mexican art and culture is strikingly different from other people. Because she combines ancient with modern to encapsulate personal experience of history, micro history. So how does she become a consumer item? While she didn't like heroes, she fills a niche that cannot be occupied by a warrior or a politician. Feminism discovered Frida in the 1970s, but she does not become a cultural item icon until the 90s. Perhaps this coincides with NAFTA and the greater visibility of Latinx in the media. Defferback says that while journalistic treatments of Kahlo recognize her defiance and otherness, they do so as a challenge to social norms as a way of noting her marketability. Wow, Divana, thanks. You, you made it this far. Let's, let's hit you up with that conclusion. In this episode 25 of Latin American Divas, we did an analysis of the self-portrait at the Mexican border of 1932 by Frida in light of Chicas Modernas theory or transnational womanhood of the interbellum in the 1920s and 30s. The second part was Frida's epistolary, her personal letters, seven in total, spanning the Great Depression and World War II, two very interesting topics. And lastly, we asked, why is Frida a feminist icon? And we gave you some examples. In the next episode 26, we are going to do Evita Peron. Woo! I can't wait. Oh my God. Thank you so much for taking the time to learn about Latin American divas and history right here at Cronista de Indias, where uh, please, please hit that subscribe button. It really helps so you never miss an episode and it helps me keep that channel going. As always, a million thanks for viewing, liking, and sharing the episode. And my personal motto, do epic shit. If you're not doing epic shit, you know, do it, do it epic harder. It's always better.